Welcome back to another episode of your favorite podcast, Dick to Dick. In this episode, I had a chance to sit down with head baseball coach, Tom Walter. Coach Walter and I spent time talking about the success and development of the baseball program and what we can kind of anticipate from the upcoming season. But I also got to learn a lot more about Coach Walter, the person, and how he is using his unique story and his journey to inspire so many others and impact the community in a positive way, plus much, much more. Take a listen. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, go Deeks. Great, Coach. So this is your first time on Deek to Deek. So share with Deacon Nation just a little bit of your background, where you're from, what it was like growing up. Yeah, so I'm from a small little coal mine, steel mill town in western Pennsylvania, Johnstown, PA. We're, we're known more for our football than than for our baseball. And um, I had a great I had a great experience growing up. It's just a good town to grow up. My uh, my grandfather was in a very important man in town. He was the police chief at one point. He was the mayor for a, for a, for a little while. He was a professor at the local college. Um, and my my dad uh, um, kind of got me into baseball when I was little. You know, just kind of playing in 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 my backyard, and uh, just something I kind of fell in love with uh, w- with right away. But uh, went to Johnstown High School from there, went to Georgetown University, played baseball at Georgetown for four years, had a, had a great experience there. You know, got to Georgetown thinking I was going to be a major leaguer like a lot of us do, right? And then we played against Seton Hall and they had a first baseman by the name of Mo Vaughn. And I was like, well, <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, if that's what it takes to be a major leaguer, then I'm in big trouble. Uh, so that, that was my first kind of wake up call that I wasn't going to play in the major leagues. Um, but uh, after that, um, you know, really got into coaching right away. I was really, uh, I was really fortunate because my dad knew uh, an assistant basketball coach at George Washington by the name of Scott Beaton. And Scott was an assistant there and, and called my dad and said that the GW was looking for a grad assistant for baseball. And I was kind of interviewing for finance jobs and trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And mm-hmm. so I went over and met with the head coach there at the time, John Castleberry. And John ended up hiring me as his grad assistant. And, and I use the term hire loosely because I don't think I got paid <laughs> anything. <laughs> uh, and uh, but, he, but they paid for two of my classes to work on my MBA and I was tutoring volleyball players. I was doing like the laundry in the equipment room. I was working construction. I was waiting tables. You know how it is when you first get in, you're just doing whatever it takes to, uh, to make it work. Um, became a full-time assistant there the following year and, and got a pay raise all the way up to like $16,000. And I thought I was the richest person on the planet. <laughs> and, um, and then was there for two years, got out of coaching for two years, worked in the minor leagues for a Yankees affiliate here in Greensboro, uh, coincidentally, um, you know, worked for the Greensboro Bats at the time for two years. Uh, they're the grasshoppers now, as you know. And um, so in their old stadium, War Memorial Stadium, and then the head coaching job at GW came open. And I was, you know, I was 27 years old, no business getting that job. But, you know, they they weren't paying they weren't paying much and it, the field was off campus and, and the program was in turmoil. So just one of those things where they, they just took a chance on it on a young 27 year old. And I was at GW for eight years. I was at the University of New Orleans for five as the head coach there. And then here at Wake Forest, this will be my my 14th season, which is which is just kind of crazy to think um, that I've been here 14 years. Just been an awesome been an awesome run. I'm very, very lucky, very blessed. Well, coach, what drew you to the game? I know you talk about your dad, but when you growing up in football country, how do you carve out this space to get for this love of baseball? Well, in, in my hometown, there's a triple ABA tournament and the triple ABA tournament um, ages 17 to 21. And they bring in teams from all over the country for this tournament. And they get like 12, 14,000 people for these games, for the hometown team game. So when I'm a, you know, when you're nine, 10, 11 years old, you're going to the triple ABA tournament and they got the, 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 the Queens in their court, you know what I mean? They got these, these, you know, beautiful young ladies that are, are the Queens that are, are, are like driving in these convertible cars through the stadium. Then you got teams from Washington, DC and Philly and New York and the hometown teams playing in front of 14,000 people. I mean, 
you know, that lit my fire. I was like, man, I want to do that. I want to play. I want to play in this tournament. When I'm old enough, I'm playing in this tournament again in front of that crowd. And uh, so it just kind of lit that fire. And then again, like I said, my dad's a baseball guy. My grandfather's a baseball guy. My uncle's a baseball guy. So it's just kind of in our family too. Yeah. So with that, how hard of a transition was it for you to go from being a player to a coach and what are some of the things that you learned as you made that transition? Yeah, I think it was a pretty natural transition, pretty easy transition. I, I fell in love with coaching almost immediately. I just love that relationship with the players and yeah. getting to work with them and, and help them get better. I mean, these players, man, they're, they're so motivated and they just want to be, they want to be great players. And if they have somebody that, that will help them on their journey, man, they're all ears and, and they're all in. I mean, they're just such, so, you know, almost immediately, I just kind of fell in love with the relationship part of coaching um, and just being on the field and getting my hands dirty and kind of getting on the dirt with our guys and, and working with them. So that's, you know, when you first start coaching, that's the thing that draws you to it is just, again, A, that relationship with the players, but B, just out there on the field with them, helping them work on on their craft. I mean, those are the two things that kind of struck me right away. And then, as you know, as you get into it more and, and truthfully, the higher you go and as you become a head coach, you unfortunately, your job becomes less about being on the field and more about some of those other things <laughs> as you mm -hmm. as you go along, you know, raising money and dealing with parents and alumni and, and all those things. So, um, and which is all good too. It's all part of, part of it. And that was, you know, one of the things that was great about my experience with the Yankees getting out of coaching for two years is I really got to see the business part of baseball, you know, the other side, you know, the marketing and the branding and how, and sales, you know, how important mm -hmm. it is. And, you know, so for me, those two years away really kind of opened my eyes to, you know, what does it take to run a, a, a baseball, you know, organization operation, you know, in a lot of ways now that the head coach is like the CEO of a, of a corporation, you know what I mean? We've got yeah. not only do we have 35 players on our club, but we've got, you know, if you count our trainer and our strength coach and the nutritionist and the mental conditioning coach and our assistant coaches and our analytics team. You know, I mean, there's 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 like 30 people that are involved in, in our academic coordinator that are involved in, in helping our players on their journey. Coach, you talked about uh, the different avenues you you went down to get to where you are now. I want to talk specifically about the number of people that you talked about that can be involved in a player's uh, process to even just getting better. You're talking about nutritionists and uh, you have staff for the, for the mental aspect and you have trainers, things like that for you and your experience at wake. You talked about being here 14 years. How has it been watching the program evolve to where we have more people that can be a resource to a student athlete to help them get better? Well, it's, it's come so far in such a short period of time. It's really been incredible. And again, you know, it, it really bothers me when people say, ah, oh, kids today in this generation, they don't want to work. Well, that, that's not true at all. These kids work, man. They put the work in and they, they're dedicated to it and they're committed to it. Now, the one difference with these kids is you've got to get them to understand why they're working on something like they really need to understand the why. And you've got to be able to explain that to them. So again, for me, to back to your point of the people we have, you know, mental conditioning has become such a bigger part of, of what we do every day. These, these young men and, and women athletes, female athletes, they're just dealing with so much more anxiety and pressure and stress than ever before. And, you know, we've got to help them. You know, we've got to, we've got to, and we talk to our players all the time about that. We almost got to treat it like it's an injury, you know, like you're recovering from a sprained ankle, you know, you know, you've got to look at your mental health the same way you look at your, your physical health. And it used to be that the stigma was that, you know, if you, if you're worried about your mental health, you were weak and you weren't mm -hmm. tough. And, and now it's like, that's, we understand now that that's not the case at all, that this is, you know, we need to, we need to be involved in this space. And then same thing with nutrition. You're like one of you know, I love how far mental health has come. I love how far nutrition has come. Like we tell our guys all the time, you can't out train nutrition. Like, a, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't have your nutrition on lockdown, I don't care what you do in the weight room. I don't care what you do on the field. Um, you know, you're not going to make the gains that you that you need to make. So, you know, when you talk about the to me, the, the two biggest areas and we were, you know, from the day I got here, we were really good at academic support and we've been really good at it, you know, since so Christopher Fisher works with our guys and, and she's fantastic. But 
mental health has grown leaps and bounds just within the last few years. Rachel Conway and her staff are doing an awesome job. And then from a nutrition standpoint, Lee Stowers is our nutrition contact and, and Tiffany Bird, you know, they're doing a, an amazing job over there, just kind of helping fuel these. It used to be our guys, like they'd be, we'd be two weeks into the season, our guys would be down 10 pounds. And now, you know, they don't lose any weight during the season. They're able to maintain their weight and maintain their, their strength through the season because of everything we provide, not only from an, uh, the, the actual food, you know, and fuel that they have really right here in our stadium, but the education process of it. We're educating these guys on, this is what your plate should look like. When you're in a heavy training day, this is what your plate should look like. When you're in a heavy recovery day, this is what your plate should look like. And when you're in the cafeteria, choose this, this, and this, not that, that, and that. Mm -hmm. You know, so things like that, just that education piece has, has come so far. And then you just add to it, like our strength coach, Mark Seaver, has done an amazing job the last few years of really kind of changing our program and, you know, becoming a lot more technical and a lot more kind of forward thinking. We, you know, we do these mobility screens now to see how our guys move. The one thing we learned is if they're not moving the right way, then 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 we're, we're asking them to do things they're not capable of doing. Like if we're, you know, we're asking, a, a, you know, a hitter to stay in his legs, but if he doesn't have the hip mobility he needs to get that back mm -hmm. hip, he's not going to be able to do that. You know, so again, like learning how they move and spending some time on, on correctives and the things they need to do to, to move better has become a big part of what we do, not only in the weight room, but in the training room. And then I'll add to it, Jeff Strom, the job he's done, you know, these, these past few years with our throwers and, and the arm care program we have, I mean, these guys are at the front of college athletics in their thinking and, and what they're providing our student athletes. So, um, you know, from a weight room standpoint, from a training room standpoint, mental health, nutrition, academic support, like those, those five areas, man, we, we do that at Wake Forest better than anybody. And I just love it. Well, coach, what drew you to Wake Forest back in now? What are we talking? Two thousand ten, maybe. What was it? Because you you had options coming out, and you were uh, with a minor league team and within the Yankees organization. I mean, we're talking about the Yankees. So, what made you that th you know what went into your decision making process to decide that Wake is where you want to be? Well, three things really. One the reputation of the school, you know, I really wanted to be at an academic school. Um, you know, I'm a Georgetown grad. I was at George Washington and, and young men who are serious about their academics and, and their, their life after baseball and their life outside of baseball. That's something that's really important to me. You know, again, I, you know, we talk to our guys all the time. Like for me, the, the thing I care about the most is their development as a human being. Like I care that you're, you're going to, you're going to leave here and you're going to be a, an amazing husband. You're going to be a, a great father. You're going to be a great citizen who gives back to his community. Like, and, and that you're comfortable in your own skin, that you have confidence and you, and you feel like that no matter what situation you're in, you'll, you'll thrive. Um, you know, so that's first and foremost for our guys. Number two, I care about their relationship with each other. Like I, I care that they're going to have a relationship with one another. That's going to last, you know, the rest of their lives that the best man in their wedding is going to be one of their teammates and, and vice versa. And they're going to, they're going to get together with this group of guys that they came in with every year for the rest of their life. Um, number three, I care that they get a meaningful degree, you know, and, and in a, in a meaningful major and a major that's going to serve them well outside of baseball. Number four, I care about their development as a player. Um, you know, individually, because I think it's hard to be a good teammate unless you're sure about your, your where your career is headed individually and you you're, you're feel good about your development path. And then number five, I care about winning. And and again, that doesn't mean I don't care about winning. I want to win. I mean, I, I want to go to Omaha. I want to win a national championship as much as anybody does. But I'm never going to put winning in front of those first four things, because those those four things, I think if those four things aren't on track, then, you know, then the winning isn't the winning is less important. So again, we want to win and we're doing everything we can. We're burning the boats to win, so to speak. But at the same time, we're not going to sacrifice those other things. So again, back to your original question, what drew me to the wake was just that, that attitude of excellence in all phases of your life. Like at some schools, you know this, Kevin, at some schools, you know, it's okay if you're not a great student or it's okay if you're not a great person, as long as you're a great basketball player or you're a great football player or you're a great baseball. It's good enough to be good at, at great at one of those three. If you're great at one of those three things, then you can survive there. At Wake Forest, man, you got to be great at all three of those things. 
you got to be a great student, you got to be a great person, and you got to be a great athlete. So I, that that's what drew me to Wake was I just that's the kind of young man I love to coach. You know, somebody who's serious about himself as a baseball player, yes, but also as a person and also as a student. Um, you know, number two, it's the ACC, man. And I mean, I, you know, you're talking about the best baseball conference in the in the country. You know, talking about national championship, the ability to win a national championship year in, year out, the ability to track national championship type talent and and high draft picks. Um, you know, I love coaching, you know, people, you know, elite players who are serious about baseball. You know, um, you know, it was a it was a great fit, not only the ACC and this this amazing campus. Uh, but people like Ron Wellman and, and, and Mike Buddy and the chance to coach players who, again, are serious about life. Um, so it was, a, it was kind of a trifecta. It was a perfect storm. That's awesome, Coach. You're talking about relationships and uh, they're going to be in your wedding. Uh, most of the groomen, groomsmen in my wedding were teammates from Wake. And so I would say you, you're definitely right about uh, all of those points you made, but if you're going to have teammates in your wedding, please prepare the family. That, <laughs> that could be well, an again, interesting I think, gathering. <laughs> I think Wake's unique that way, Kevin. I think one of the things that's great about Wake is like our freshmen, you know, the freshman class that come in together, they leave together. Like it, we're not bringing in junior college guys. We're not bringing in a ton of transfers. These guys are growing up together and they're, 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 they're getting old together. And I, and I love that about Wake. I love just that, that that's who we are, that we build our team around a freshman class that grows up together. You know, I just, I think that's, I think that's special. Yeah. And I, and you don't see that in other places. Like you don't see that in, in a lot of the schools we compete against. Coach, uh, I want to talk about another subject. Uh, what I, something that I read and knew about you already, but uh, the story of the transplant. I know you've told it several times, but for Deacon Nation, uh, just kind of talk about the transplant with Kevin Jordan and what that process was like. And if you don't mind talking about what you went through and just, I just think it was a fascinating story. Well, I'm, I'm happy to talk about, it. I'm just so proud of Kevin and, and the man he's become. And, you know, that story was never about me. It was about him. I mean, I, you know, here's a young man who, Kevin, Kevin Jordan was as talented as any high school baseball player there was. You know, he, he was a five-tool player. He could run, he could throw, he could hit, he could hit for power, and he could play defense. And he was like a surefire first-round draft pick, like a guy that was on everybody's board. Senior year of high school, Kevin gets sick in the spring of his senior year. And at first, they don't know what it is. They didn't. They they thought it was just a virus. And I'm getting calls from scouts that are saying, hey, I'm seeing Kevin Jordan play, and you know, he's not running well and he doesn't look good. He looks like he's lost some weight. What's going on? So I'm calling his dad and his dad saying, oh, you know, it's just a virus. You know, we'll, we're on some antibiotics. We'll be fine. You know, we'll be fine in a couple of weeks. It's all good. And I'm like, okay. So then fast forward to April, I'm getting more calls from scouts saying, Hey, he's missing some games now. You know what I mean? He's like, he missed the last two games. He wasn't able to play, you know, what's going on here. So I call the dad and the dad's like, he's like, coach, I, I don't know what's going on. He goes, we, we, we have no idea. So I called Kevin's agent from the Wasserman group, Joel, Joel Wolf from Wasserman. And I was like, Joel, what, what do you got? Like, what's like, what's going on here? He's like, Hey, we're, we're getting Kevin to Emory hospital to see a specialist. Like we, we, he was been seeing this, you know, this local doctor at home and, and the local doctor just hadn't gotten a handle on it. He just, he needed to get to Emory hospital. So they got him to Emory, which is about 90 minutes from home. And, uh, and he, and he saw a nephrologist and they diagnosed it as a kidney problem. You know, they basically said, Hey, your kidney functions down to 15% and you've got a condition called ankyovasculitis where this bacteria gets into your blood and it can attack any one of your organs. In your case, it attacked your kidneys and your kidneys are failing. So we've got to put you on this medication, try to reverse this. So he's taking all these medicines, this medication, you know, we're dealing with his doctors, you know, like our, we're connecting his doctors at Emory with his doctors here, with, with his future doctors here, just to make sure that we can care for him once he gets here, you know, and I'll never forget the dad calls me and the dad calls me. He's like, Hey, is Kevin's scholarship still good? And I was like, heck yeah, his scholarship's good. I was like, this is Wake Forest. We don't, 
we don't abandon kids just because they're, they might not, they may or may not be able to play. Like we're, we're here, we're in this thing for the long haul. And I, and I really believe that a lot of places he, that young man would have never showed up on campus. Um, but at Wake Forest, that's just not how we do things here, which I, that's again, one of the reasons I love Wake and love being here. And um, so anyway, uh, Kevin fast forward, <laughs> Kevin gets drafted by the Yankees. Um, the Yankees, <laughs> you know, he was in no position to sign a pro contract because again, his, by this time, his kidney functions down to 8%. Um, so he gets on the campus and I, and I'll, Kevin, I'll tell you, I hadn't seen Kevin since he had been on campus for his recruiting trip in November. Um, and I saw him when he got, got to campus in August to start class. And I, if he hadn't been sitting with his parents at his restaurant, I wouldn't have recognized him. I mean, you're talking about somebody who lost 50 pounds. His, wow. his, skin tone was a totally different shade i mean he he looked like a hospital patient he did not look like an athlete you know when he was on campus as a as a as in the fall of his senior year he, he looked like a free safety on a football team mm. i mean he was chiseled out of granite he was you know 195 pounds of muscle and just looked like an athlete i saw him you know again eight months later and and he looked like a hospital patient it was just totally different transformation it was unbelievable and um so we met with his doctor the next day, Dr. Friedman here at, at Wake Baptist. And um, Dr. Friedman, you know, our trainer, Jeff Strom's with me and, and myself and Kevin and his parents. And doctor, first thing Dr. Friedman says is, hey, you're going to need a transplant. And it was like, whoa, the family was like totally like taken aback by that because up till then they thought medication was going to was going to turn this around. And the doctor's like, no, we're, we're way past the point where we can save your kidneys. Like we've got to get you off the medication make sure the ankybacteria is gone. And then as soon as it's gone, we need to get you a new kid. Like that, that's gotta happen. You know, it was just funny. It was like one of these things, I, I believe in fate. And I, I believe that, that we're put in certain places in our life at certain times for certain reasons that sometimes are, are known and sometimes they aren't. But, you know, in that moment, when the, when the, when the doctor said that, I, I, I said to myself, I said, it's gonna be me. I know it's gonna be me. Like it was just, you know, it's just one of those things where it just hit me. I was like, I'm going to, I'm the guy that's supposed to do this. It just like occurred to me. It was like, it just came to me. And so we're touring around the facility and the, and I, I went up to the dad and I was like, Hey, Mr. Jordan, I'll, I'll get tested. If you want me to get tested, um, you know, to see if I'm a match. And the, Mr. Jordan's like, Oh no, we're, I think we're good. You know, Kevin's mom can do it or I'll do it or his brother will do it. We'll, we've got somebody in the family that's going to be able to do it. And I said, okay, well, the offer's there if you need it. So Kevin enrolls in school. The, doc, the doctor said he couldn't have a roommate because he had to go on dialysis. He was doing dialysis three times a week at this point. And the doctor's like, look, that's not enough. We need you on in-room dialysis every day. So Kevin would hook up to the dialysis machine at night and he would, have, he would be plugged into the dialysis machine from 10 at night to like eight in the morning. Then he'd go to class and then he'd go back in to, on the dialysis machine, do another round of dialysis. Sometimes he'd come over to practice if he could, if he felt strong enough to come over to practice, he'd come, um, you know, he, he didn't do anything. He'd just kind of hang out, you know, with the guys. Um, but that was his life, taking classes and, and being on a dialysis machine while they were searching for a donor. Well, turns out his mom couldn't do it. You know, they, you need to be an 80 on the scale and she was like a 78 and it, it broke her heart. I mean, she was crushed. And his dad couldn't do it for one reason or another. His brother couldn't do it for one reason or another. And fast forward to December, actually just before Thanksgiving, um, you know, I was on the way um, to Myrtle Beach. We have some family in Myrtle Beach. I was in the car with the kids and, and Mr. Jordan called me and he's like, hey, coach, are you still willing to get tested? Because nobody in our family is a match can do it. And I was like, heck yeah. I was like, just tell me what to do. So he gave me the name of the donor coordinator here in Winston-Salem. I called her. And I made an appointment to come in and get the first round of tests. The first round of tests are an ABO cross match, basically where they put my blood and his blood in a Petri dish and see how the blood gets along. And then you have to do like a, a, a urine analysis where they, they analyze my urine to see how my kidneys are functioning. And then there's, a, there's like one other test that you go through. And so I started that process to, to get tests. And um, so then the insurance companies got involved and they're like, well, you can't do this in North Carolina because we thought it was going to be at Wake Baptist. And the insurance company's like, no, no, it's got to be in Georgia. It's got to be because Kevin's insurance. 
So we had to start this process over in Emory. And I didn't tell anybody I was getting tested because, I, you know, again, I wasn't sure I was a match. I knew like deep down that I thought I was going to be a match, but I didn't, you know, until I knew for sure I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to tell anybody, including Kevin. Kevin didn't, only Kevin's dad knew that I was being tested. Um, and I told my mom, my mom was the other person that knew. Um, <laughs> you always got to tell mom. Yeah, so moms <laughs> know everything. Even what you don't tell them, they still know. <laughs> you got to tell mom because if you, if you don't tell them and they find out a different way, they're never going to talk to you again. <laughs> so, so I, um, I'm going through this process and then I have to go back and do all the whole process again through Emory. So pass the first three tests and then they bring you down to Emory hospital. I went down there for 48 hours and, and went through a battery of tests. You know, they shot some dye into my system and did an MRI to track the dye through my system they do psychological tests, they do physical tests. And at this point, you know, they're, they know you're, they think you're a match, but they're just trying to make sure you can physically survive um, the surgery, like that you'll be fine after the surgery. So anyway, um, all this is done. And now we're just waiting to hear if I'm a match or not, you know, and it's, you know, Kevin, this, this whole process is so crazy. I don't, I, hopefully they've changed this, but back then, like literally the doctors would meet once a week and they'd have a stack of folders on their, on the table while they eat lunch once a week and they pick a folder and decide if that was a match or not. And that's how, that's how they were making. And then, so the process was dragging on and, and a couple of weeks went by and I hadn't heard anything. And Erica Henderson, who is the donor coordinator at Emory, I'm calling her like every day. And I'm like, Erica, what's going on? Like I, I want to get this done before our season. Like, I don't want this to impact our season. And if once our season starts, I'm not going to be able to do this until the summer. And I don't want Kevin to wait till the summer. Like, I don't like, he's like, he's on a dialysis machine, 18 hours a day. I, and that's no life for anybody. I don't, I, I want to, I want to have this surgery before our season. So she tells me, she's like, coach, I promise you, I'll call you. I'll call you tomorrow. I promise they're meeting, they're meeting at lunch tomorrow. And I'll call you. I'll make sure they look at your folder and I'll call you tomorrow. And I was like, thank you. So that just so happens that the next day was our first practice. And I never have my phone at practice because, you know, I, there's, I'm a baseball coach. There's no, nobody that needs to get a hold of me that that important, right? So, <laughs> so, but I had my phone with me on this day because I was waiting for Erica's call. So Erica called and she's like, she's like, you're a match. And, I, and again, I'd already known that, but I, I just said, all I said to her was, I was like, thank God. Thank you. Thank God. She's like, she gave me the surgery date and we hung up. And uh, so I went back to practice, finished practice. I called Kevin that night and I was like, Hey man, you know, what are you doing on February 6th? And he was like, my calendar's free. Cause he had, he didn't come back for the, for the second semester. Cause again, he was so sick that you know, he couldn't, he just couldn't physically go to classes anymore. Um, you know, so he, um, he was home and I called him. I said, look, February 6th, we're, I said, it turns out I'm a match. I said, I'll see you on February 6th. We'll get this done. And uh, it was pretty good. But um, so anyway, um, you know, come February 6th, I told the team, you know, I told the team that day um, and uh, and the team was just awesome. I mean, they they couldn't have they couldn't have handled it any better. And uh, they just they just started clapping. And it was it really meant a lot to me that I had the support of the team. Um, and then I went to Ron Wellman and Ron couldn't have been better about it. You know, here I am, you know, kind of basically a first year coach going into my first season. We're supposed to be decent. And, um, you know, and I, I, Ron asked me one of the, the greatest, I, I explained what I wanted to do. And Ron, all Ron said to me, he looked at me, he goes, what can we do for you? Like, how can we help you? And it's just a, such a Ron Wellman question. He wasn't worried about the team. He wasn't worried about Wake Baseball. He was worried about me as a person. And that just, that meant a lot to me. And uh, so I said to Ron, I said, uh, I said, you know, I'd really like to keep this quiet. Like I'd like for this not to be like a big deal. I said, I just want to get in there, have this surgery, get to the season and like, you know, get Kevin healthy and, and back here on campus. So Ron was like, you got it, no problem. So the next day Ron met with Steve Shutt, our sports information director and found out that you know, there were people that already knew and the media was already kind of on this, on this story. So Ron calls me the next day and he goes, Hey, we're not going to be able to keep this quiet. <laughs> and I was like, Ron, I, I said, I haven't even told my kids yet. And I said, my kids don't know. 
I said, and I don't, I don't want them to worry. I said, so I don't want to tell them until after the surgery. So Ron worked out a deal, Steve Shutt and Ron worked out a deal with the media that we would do some filming here. We would have a press conference here before the surgery on campus at our field, but that we, that nobody would release the story until I told my kids. So fast forward a couple days and uh, I'm talking to a buddy of mine and I'm like telling him I'm gonna donate my kidney to Kevin Jordan. And he's like, he's like, well, He's like, can you do that? And I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about? He's like, well, isn't Kevin Black? And I was like, stunned by that question. I was like, oh my God. I was, and I, as I thought about it for a second, I realized it wasn't a race. I knew this guy, it wasn't a racist mm -hmm. question or a malicious question. It was a question of just not understanding science. And mm -hmm. so I said to him, I, I'll never for Kevin, I'll never forget my response, which was, well, yeah, my blood and his blood are the same. And that's all that matters. And so anyway, that led to this nonprofit that we have, which we'll get to later. Um, but as far as being in the moment of the story, um, you know, just, and one of the incredible things in this, when this surgery happens. So fast forward, February 6th, we have the surgery. Everything goes great. Like everything's perfect. The doctor comes in and he's showing me the iPad. He's like, look, Kevin's creatinine before the surgery was 22. And like three hours after the surgery, his creatinine was 1.6. And he's like, you know, and it's like, and he'll, he'll settle in around one five or one four. He goes, but he goes, the kidney is, is pink and it's functioning beautifully. And I was just like, I was just blown away by this, this little kidney, right. Can do, can make such a difference. And I, when I saw Kevin the next day, I went into his room the next day, I was up walking around and I went into his room for the first time. This, I saw him since before the surgery and he looked awesome like the color had come back in his skin and he was like he said to me i'll never forget he goes i feel like i could do 100 push-ups he goes i feel he goes i feel better than i have in a really long since before all this started and it was just to me it was just so incredible that this again this one little surgery could just make such a difference in somebody's life um you know and, and how they feel um so anyway you know a week later um you know um you know, not even like five days later, I'm back at practice, you know, a couple of days after that, I had to fly to a funeral. One of the, the father, one of our players passed away from cancer, so I flew up to Boston to be there for that. Um, and then three days after that, we were playing at LSU. So 10 days, 10 days after the surgery, we're, we're back on the field playing LSU for, for opening day. And, um, Kevin came to visit about six weeks later. He came for the Miami series and uh, threw out the first pitch and he looked great. And the, the support was just, the support we received from the Wake community um, was, just in, was just incredible. And my kids, I'll never forget calling my kids and letting them know that the surgery that happened and it was all, you know, everything was good. And there was kind of silence on the other end of the phone. I was still in the hospital and I, I asked them if they were okay. And my daughter, Casey, she goes, well, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm doing great. She goes like, well, then we're great. She goes, if you're great, we're great. So I was just, I was, I was, I was glad that they, and they were young, you know, they were young. My daughter was maybe eight. My son was maybe 11 um, at the time. So they were, yeah. they were young, but, um, but anyway, it was, it was, uh, everything was kind of couldn't have went better in the support we got. And, but, it, but it, one of the things that always struck me in that original story was, because of what my friend said and the comment he made, the question he asked, in the original story, nobody talked about race in that original story. Like it wasn't none of this thing was on, you know, ESPN. It was on New York Times. It, you know, it was everywhere. It was, you know, Oprah Winfrey, like all of it. And nobody talked about the race part of this story, Kevin. And I, I think that's one of the I think that's one of the reasons we're still having, you know, we're still in this situation we're in where, where race is, is, you know, we haven't made the progress we should have made when it comes to this race conversation is because nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to address the elephant in the room and say, you know, I'm white, you're black. Like, like let's, our blood is the same. Let's get through this. Like, like what's like, what's going on here. So, you know, being intentional to me around race is, is an important part of, of us getting to the other side of it. You know, Herman Urey, do you know that name, Kevin, Herman Urey? Who doesn't in Wake Athletics? Rock star. Rock star. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So Herman, I'm talking to Herman Urey. We, well, Kevin and I started a nonprofit a couple of years ago after George Floyd um, was murdered. And I'm calling all of 
my players of color and just checking in on them and making sure they're doing okay. And one of those calls was to Kevin, of course. I'm saying, you know, how's your family? You guys okay? You know, do you, do you need to vent? You need somebody to talk to? You know, I'm here for whatever you need. I mean, again, I have no way of knowing what you or your family is going through, but I just want you to know I'm thinking about you and I'm here. And during that conversation, I told Kevin that story that I just told you about our blood is the same. And I'd never told, I'd never told anybody that story for 10 years. But I told Kevin that story. And when I said to him, you know, yeah, you know, our blood is the same and that's all that matters. As soon as I said that, I was like, man, that's the message the world needs to hear. Like the, the world needs to see me, old white guy, Kevin, young black guy, standing next to each other, arm in arm, saying our blood is the same. It's all that matters. So I called a friend of mine in the at kind of at the intersection of social entrepreneurship and education technology. And I said, here's what I want to do. I said, I want to take our story into the schools. I want to tell our story of shared blood. Our blood is the same. That's all that matters. I said, but I don't, I don't want it to be a 45 minute motivational speech where we leave and then everybody's behavior is the same the next day. Like I want to deliver some, some curriculum that these schools can use to kind of enforce the message, you know, that, hey, we're in this together. So back to Dr. Yuri, I called Dr. Yuri shortly after this idea and I was telling him what I wanted to do. And Dr. Yuri told me like the most powerful thing anybody said to me, you know, maybe my whole life, um, which was, he said, Tom, he said, from the time a young black man can think for himself, he understands that he's got to be super intentional about every interaction he has with a white person. He's got his body language, the way he dresses, the words he chooses, facial expressions. He understands that he has to be intentional about all. Now, he might choose to ignore all those things and be a certain way, but he understands that he has to make that decision. He goes, and until white people understand that they need to have that same level of intentionality in their interactions with people of a different race, he goes, we won't get there. He goes, and we can't get there until we get there, to, unless we get there together. You know, and it just like struck me that level of intentionality about this race conversation. It just really resonated with me. And that's, you know, again, the work we're doing in the schools with this nonprofit is all about getting these kids to acknowledge who they are understand what they stand for or acknowledge their differences with each other and then have conversations about it. Like, let's figure out what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes and be someone else for a day. Let's, let's talk about race in the media and race in movies and race in music. Like, let's talk about race. You know, we've made so many great strides and we still have ways to go, obviously in the LGBTQ community. But we've made great strides in, the, in that area. It's, it's all that stuff is way more accepted than ever before. But have we really made as many strides in, in this race conversation? I, I don't know that we have. Like, I, we're still way behind. Like, how are we still having the same conversations that Martin Luther King was having on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial 60 years ago? Like, how are we having those same conversations today? And I just, I don't, I don't understand it. And it, to me, it's got to start with the kids in the schools and that intentionality around, right? Like one of my one of my pet peeves is when people say, oh, I don't see color. What do you mean you don't see color? You sure do. <laughs> you damn sure do see color. <laughs> like let's let's acknowledge that we see color and be intentional about it. Yeah. Don't tell me you don't see it because, the, because you do. So anyway, I, I'm sure I got way off track there, but but the uh, but the kidney story. And, and Kevin Jordan is, is working for our nonprofit. He's our director of, of community service and, um, and community outreach and uh, is crushing it. And, uh, and he's, you know, I'm just, I'm so proud of him. I'm proud of this organization, the work it's doing in the schools. We, got a, we won a Stuart Scott Inspire Award um, last summer, which was incredible to be part of the ESPYs and, and win a sports humanitarian award for the work we're doing. And I'm just, Again, I'm just so proud of Kevin and and uh, and the organization. Coach, that was a fascinating story. I mean, there were so many parts of that, so many lives that were affected in such a positive way. You talked about how you just knew it was going to be you and that that was a part of your journey. What made you decide to make that decision that you're going to walk in this calling, that you're going to walk in the, in the purpose 
of it when you are a match that you're just going to go ahead and do it what was that coach because that's not an easy thing to just arrive to but you seem to have gotten to that point very quickly so truth be told when i said that to mr jordan i didn't really know what it meant <laughs> like i was like i, I wasn't 100 percent sure what that entailed um but but the reality is when you're when you're from johnstown pennsylvania my hometown like that's what you do you give the shirt off your back for your family for your friends i mean that's how that's how i was raised and then you know, along the way, different stops in my journey. You know, when I was in Washington, D.C., we had 9-11. And, you know, we drove past the Pentagon every day where that airplane crashed into the Pentagon. And, and so 9-11 was kind of thrust in our face. And then I get to New Orleans and it's Hurricane Katrina. And we evacuated from Hurricane Katrina and had to take our team to New Mexico. And and so, like, when when this came up, I was just like, okay, let's, like, what has to happen and how do we get there? So it's like, it, it, it became all about, okay, this is what Kevin needs. And he's one of my, he's one of my players. He's part of my family. And if I have the ability to, to, to help him, I mean, there's no way I'm not going to help. Like it's like not helping is not even an option. Like, it's like, okay. It's like anything else. It's like, if, if we're, you know, if our shortstop can't feel ground balls, it's like, okay, what do we got to do to change that? And You know, Kevin needs another, Kevin needs another kidney. What do we got to do to change my kidneys a match? Let's go. You know, it's like, you know, I wish so, I would have you know. had you as my baseball coach growing up because I couldn't hit the curveball, and they were like, well, <laughs> Kevin can't hit the curveball. Let's you're going to play football now, sir. That's you. <laughs> Well, but, I, I understand. As I tell, we have lots of guys who can't hit the curveball. And as I tell them, the best way the best way to deal with that is don't miss the fastball. Like, don't when you get a fastball, don't miss. The fastball. I, I like that philosophy. So, <laughs> Coach, real quick, you had named the nonprofit "Get in the Game." Where did that name come from? You know, Kev, that was Kevin's idea. Um, oh, you wow. know, Kevin. Kevin said, and we were, he and I talked about this, you know, in the beginning and Kevin was like, oh man, you know, at the time Kevin's living in Georgia and he was trying to figure out what he was going to do with his life. He was talking about being a teacher. And then once, once this idea was born, I was like, how about you, how about you move to Winston-Salem and, and work for this organization? And he was like, I'll be there on Monday. Like he was <laughs> like, he, I, and he like packed up his car and he moved to Winston-Salem. I mean, that's what he did. And I was, it was incredible. But he was the one who called me. He was like, you know, coach, he goes, when he goes, when I needed help, he goes, he goes, you, you stepped up. He goes, you got off the sideline and you got in the game. He goes, that's what I think we should name our organization. And I was like, that's perfect. Because again, like so many people just ignore this race conversation, but it's not enough to, and it's not enough, you know, you have to be, you have to make a choice to be an upstander. Like you can't just be a bystander anymore. That's not acceptable. Just when you see, or you hear something that you know is, is inappropriate or racist, it's not okay just to pretend it didn't exist. You've got to, you've got to say something and do something. So the, the message to our, the kids in our program are, man, you know, it's not good enough to be on the sidelines anymore. You got to get in the game. So you know, again, that's Kevin. It's 100 Kevin's idea, and um, and and we we filed for our nonprofit status. We got a website, um, filed for our nonprofit status, and and we got a board of directors, raised some money, and we were we were off. That's that's awesome, awesome, Coach. Glad to see that you are able to take the situation again. You talked about a kidney, and look at what has happened since then. Um, and so much has come from that. So I want to talk a little bit about this past season, Coach. Talk about some of the highlights uh, from this past season uh, with the baseball team. Well, so number one, we won forty-one games. So it was the it was the second most regular season wins in in program history. Uh, super proud of that. Went to the NCAA tournament, which is always goal number one um, with our ball club, and um, you know had some great individual accomplishments. Had the ACC Pitcher of the Year. Um, you know, had a couple All-Americans, a couple freshman All-Americans and Tommy Hawk and Nick Kurtz. Um, so it's just a it was a, it was a really good year for the ball club. And we were young. We were really young. So um, but the thing I'm really most proud of is just the the, the team culture that we that we built. You know, 2021, um, you know, we had a bad year. You know, we struggled and we just 
we were coming out of COVID and we had a bunch of seniors who quite honestly thought they were going to be drafted as juniors and be gone. And they, they didn't expect to be back as seniors. And then we got off to a little bit of a slow start, you know, and then we had COVID as a team, you know, we had about 16 guys that have COVID kind of all at once. So we went down we missed a weekend series. And then we went to Miami with like half a team and, and lost a couple games down there. So we were, we were scuffling and, and when that happened, we had all these seniors that, you know, quite honestly started to play for themselves and not, and not for the ball club. And it was a tough year. Now we were able to salvage it at the end and play well at the end and, and really had a, an opportunity to play some freshmen and some sophomores that, that might not have otherwise play. Um, but what happened was that summer we sat down as a staff and, and we had a couple coaching changes in that, in the midst of that as well. But we sat down as a staff and we said, okay, never again, are we going to have a fractured team culture? We've got to, We've got to become more intentional about our team culture. You know, that level of intentionality we were talking about before. We've got to have that when it comes to developing leaders and, and, and who we are as an organization and what we stand for um, right, right here. And that's what we did. Like, so we, first thing we did, we, we took the team, we had a team book that we read called It Takes What It Takes by Trevor Moad. We went away on a team retreat. Um, Ken Miller, hosted us at his place over in Summerfield. <laughs> and we had the, we had all the guys in those cabins and for two days and we turned off our cell phones for two days and we talked about the book. We hung out with each other. We shared meals. You know, to me, team culture is all about shared language and shared experiences. And, you know, getting all our guys kind of, kind of speaking the same language um, was important, but having them share that experience with one another, that bonding experience was important too. And then later in the fall, we took the team to Washington, D.C. Um, we, we took a tour of the monuments. We went to the Holocaust Museum. We went to Arlington Cemetery. We went to the Naval Academy, toured there. You know, and just we're really talking about, okay, who are we? What do we stand for? And what do we want out of this thing? Um, so, you know, for us, um, you know, that, that building of that team culture started in the fall. And our guys really kind of rallied around it. And they, they decided that our team motto was all in. You can see my all in bracelet. And, you know, it was like one of those things where it's like, um, you know, the guys make fun of me all the time for my little sayings, Kevin. And one of my, my one of my little sayings is you can't be a little bit pregnant. You're either pregnant or you're not. <laughs> and, and so and so that's that's kind of where all in started. You're either you're either all in on who we are, who we are as deeks. Like you're either all in on that or you're all out. Like there's no. There's no gray area there. It's either a hundred percent in or a hundred percent out. So, yeah. um, so all in became our team motto and, and it really kind of turned into a special year for the guys. We, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't play as well in the postseason as we had hoped we would, you know, but I guess only one team gets to say that they did. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so, but, you know, we returned, um, the, the, the bones of a, of a really good ball club. And we've kind of picked up on that this year and, playing really well this fall went to Tennessee beat Tennessee at Tennessee this fall Tennessee was number one in the country last year and and uh and beat GW in a, in a scrimmage here so we're kind of really happy with where we are as a ball club and, and what we're building we're, we're excited for this season coach could you kind of share with Deacon Nation the impact of the updated facilities at the couch and what the players now have at their exposure to help with their development on the field. I know uh, you mentioned the importance of team culture, uh, but also a component of that has to be upgrading and uh, upgrading facilities. Kind of talk about the the facilities that that we've seen an upgrade on. Well, that's a huge part of what we've been able to accomplish here the past few years. Like our our player development is really second to none. You look at our draft record. And the players that, you know, we've had probably $21 million in signing bonuses out of here the last few years, which is just incredible. We've had two first rounders on the mound. You know, we might have, and I'm, you know, there's a good chance we're going to have three first rounders this year and, wow. and maybe another three next year, which is just insane. You know, I mean, that's just, that's not happening anywhere. And, and it's really because of this facility, you know, when, when I sat down originally with David Couch and, and again, even Mike Buddy and Ron Wellman way back when, and talked about what we wanted this facility to look like you know we spent a lot of time talking about about okay what do we need so the players can get better you know so number one we need a training room where they can where they can stay healthy we need a weight room we need a nutrition area you know where we can fuel them properly 
we need a team meeting room where we can where we can get together and and talk about team culture, shared language, and shared experiences. Um, so we checked all those boxes. We needed a big league clubhouse um, to where the guys felt like big leaguers, like where they, you know, again we. You know, one of these things, one of these, like, when I realized my first year when we were in this facility, it was like, we used to, like, be in the right field corner, and we'd come back from a road trip, and we'd be walking down that hill, and it would be dark, and it'd be slippery, and we'd be coming back to, a, you know, a moldy clubhouse, and it's like, you know, after after a tough loss, it's like the last thing you wanted to come back to, and now this place, you walk into this place after a tough loss, and you just feel better about it. It's like, you know, what I mean? it's like, you, know you just sleep, you're like, Man, things aren't so bad. We're, we're okay. We're going to be okay. Um, but anyway, from the player development standpoint, the pitching lab and the hitters building and the weight room and the nutrition and the training room. I mean, I just can't say I, nobody in the country has a better player development facility than we do. And it's because of guys like David couch and, Matt Crawford and Phil Rogers and and um, and others who stepped up along the way to make that a make that a reality. I mean, our, you know, I I don't have to tell you this. You know this better than anybody. Like I, I can't imagine where we'd be in all our sports here at Wake if it weren't for our our alums and our donors. Mm-hmm. Because you know the, the the things we you know our football team getting really really good. You know is not coincidental. It's it's come with facilities. You know, and you look at our soccer teams good every year and our golf teams are good and tennis is good every year and cross country just won the ACC championship. I mean, and we're, we're good at all our sports here. And it's, you know, facilities have coincided with that rise to the top. And it's it's important. It's kind of who we are and what we do. Mm-hmm. We provide the best of the best for our student athletes provide, you know, providing our student athletes with a with with everything that they need to be championship athletes on and off the field. That's who we are. Coach, uh, one last question. What, you've been at Wake since 2010. What has been your favorite Deacon moments on the field and off the field? Well, on the field, it has to be a super regional in Florida. We had a walk-off home run against the, (laughs) against Florida in the super regional. And uh, there's several favorite moments there. I mean, Ben Brazil, you know, hits the homer. But I saw later in the night, I saw that Twitter video of the football players reacting to that home run. <laughs> and they were just, they were watching it on TV and they were just going crazy. And I just love that moment because it really speaks to the culture we have across all sports here where we're in. Like when football wins, we feel like we won. And when basketball's good, you know what I mean? Like we're all in this thing together. And and I just love how good football's been and, and basketball coach Forbes the year he had last year and, and how good we are in all our sports just makes us so proud. So that fame, that my favorite moment on the field was, was that home run, but it wasn't just the home run. It was just how our other teams reacted to that and, and how invested they were in our success. I just love that about Wake Forest. You know, off the field, you know, again, I, I mean, I guess I have to point to the kidney donation only because, not because of of my part in that, but because of Wake Forest part in that. You know, again, I've told many people this, like, I don't think that story happens anywhere else. Because first of all, that student athlete doesn't show up on campus anywhere else because his scholarship's probably not good. But also because like our doctors here collaborated with his doctors there and our people here, our academic coordinator and and our, our administration just made Kevin and his family feel like he was going to be taken care of. Like you think about it as a dad, like, are you going to let your son move seven hours away from home where he knows nobody when he's fighting for his life? Like that's a hard thing to do. And unless you trust the people you're sending him to, like, how could you do that? And, and Wake Forest just went out of their way to make the Jordans feel like their son was going to be taken care of. And again, so I, my favorite moment is that just because I don't, I don't think it would have happened anywhere else. Like, I don't think there's another program in the country where that story could have even happened. That's awesome. Well, coach, again, thank you for taking the time to be, uh, to be on Deke to Deke and talk about the baseball program and let Deacon nation know a little bit more about you. Uh, again, we're looking forward to another great season coming up from you guys and want to encourage everybody to come out to the couch to catch a game, you know,